we begin this morning with a favorite from Mary Oliver. Wild geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about your despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscape, over the prairies and the deep rivers, the mountains and the trees. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clear blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over again, announcing your place in the family of things. As we prepare for the word preached, would you join with me your hearts and minds in prayer? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So there's this old Kathy Matea song, and the video opens to a city street, and you see people rushing by one another. No one's really paying attention to anyone else. You know how it is when you're busy, when you've got some place to be. And there's a man on the street. He's disheveled. He looks kind of dirty. He's not had a bath in a long time. We can assume from the way he looks that perhaps he doesn't have a place to stay. Somebody walks past him and they give him a dollar bill and he says, God bless you. And then the, then the camera pans over and there's a woman. She's well dressed. She's walking along. And people are not paying attention, so much so that they keep bumping into her, and bumping into her. The song goes on, and it's about how we all have this deep need for connection and relationship. We all have this deep need to be seen and loved and valued and cared for. But then the chorus goes, they roll by just like water. And I guess we never learn. We go through life parched and empty, standing knee deep in a river and drowning of thirst. That line always catches me. We're standing knee deep in a river and we're dying of thirst. At the end of that video, you see the man that you saw at the beginning and you see this woman, and they look at each other. And you realize that we're supposed to see them in the same way, that they both need the same thing. They both need to be seen and loved and valued and they both need to belong. And yet, neither of them do. The comparison in the video, it's like the difference between these two trees that Chase read about for us from the prophet Jeremiah. The shrub that's in the desert that needs relief. It's dying of thirst. But then there's this tree that's planted by the water where its roots can sink deep down and where it can get what it needs. Except that in the video, we realize that we're all the shrub. Friends, it occurs to me that all we have to do is look around in our world to see that there are so many folks 
who are living this reality, that we, there are so many people who are standing knee deep in a river and they're dying of thirst. So many of us on any given day feel like we're not loved, we're not enough, we're not good enough, like we're not valued, like we don't have connection, like we don't have community. And even when we do, sometimes there are these other voices that come in and tell us to the contrary. This is not just the stuff of ancient prophecies nor of cheesy 90s country videos. This is real. It's part of our everyday lives. And friends, that's why it is so amazing to watch you all do the work of spreading God's love at Pride Fest every year. You know, when Pride Fest started 10 years ago, I walked around with flyers and I invited people to church. But I don't need to do that anymore because you do that. 45 of you and the church dog <laughs> gathered together yesterday and handed out, I, I think it was close to 1,300 of those little rainbow hearts that say, God loves you exactly the way you are. And what I love about watching you do this, church, is that you're so unafraid you're not throwing them out like candy. It would be easy to do that. No, instead, you go up to people individually and you say it to each person you hand one of those hearts to. And I watched yesterday. Some of you took the insides, you handed them to the people who were right there, ready to receive whatever you had. But some of you walked out onto the margins to the people who were standing alone and far back. You're only able to do that because you have learned to be watering cans. Because we receive this wellspring of God's grace all the time, and you've learned how to collect it and share it with people that you meet. Now, if you look at pictures from our group in the parade, you'll see Lisa driving the truck uh, with some folks in the back of the truck, and you'll see us walking. And then in the back, you'll see this gigantic rainbow flag, which um, my friend Ben brought from St. Louis. And Ben and my friend Tom from Chicago carried this giant rainbow flag at the back of our delegation. And before the parade started, I gathered everybody up around and reminded the folks who were there, the 45 people and the church dog, of how we hand out these hearts. And then I said, don't get behind the rainbow flag, the big wall of rainbow. Don't get behind it. Because when that's happened in the past, when we've not had you know, something to kind of bind us in as a church, we get all spread out along the parade route. And we're not together any longer. And so I would watch people like handing out hearts, and then they'd look, and they'd be like, ooh, the rainbow flag is coming. I have to run up ahead. And of course, I'm taking my time and being very intentional and handing hearts to people. Um, you are loved exactly for who you are. You are loved exactly for who you are. You are loved exactly for who you are. And just about that time, I hear Ben yell at me, share the love of God faster. Because here comes the rainbow flag and I'm about to get swept up in it, right? living in parched times. We're living in parched times when people need the love of God more than ever. I will tell you that even though it's been 50 years since the Stonewall riots, which sparked and catalyzed the modern gay rights movement, that the FBI reported just last year that over the past three years, hate crimes have gone up. 
We're living in parched times. Which is why, friends, <laughs> share the love of God faster is not just funny, it's prophetic. It's not just funny, it's prophetic. And remember, prophets are not people who look into a crystal ball and they tell the future. Prophets are people who look at the world around them and they tell it like it is. And they remind us of the way God dreamt it would always be. So people of God, hear me this morning. We have so much work to do to continue to gather up that outpouring of grace that comes from God so easily, so readily. It's literally, it's literally the ground that we walk on because we have roots that go down deep, that suck up that grace whenever we need it. We have so much work to do to gather up all of that grace and to share it with people in this parched world. How do I know that? I know that because I've been doing the biblical self-defense workshop in this town for 10 years, and every year, every year, every year, there are young people and there are old people alike who come into that room who are absolutely brittle and scorched from the love the sin, hate the sinner, assault from modern day purity mongers. Beloveds, there are people who have been sucked dry by that kind of theology. Some of you have been sucked dry by that kind of theology too. But I want to remind you that God's living water, God's unconditional love, it might have been diverted from you, but it cannot stay away from you. And so if you are sitting here this morning, and if you are feeling parched and brittle, and like you've been sucked dry on this Pride Sunday morning, if you are a gay man or a lesbian woman or a bisexual person or a pansexual person, if you are a transgender or a genderqueer person or a non-binary person, or if you're the parent of such a beloved child and you feel as parched as the shrub that's in the passage from Jeremiah that Chase read for us, because you've been told that this living water is not for you or for your children, then I want you to know, one, whoever told you that was wrong, and B, or two, whichever. <laughs> I want you to know that God's love and God's deep indwelling of peace and God's grace is here for you no matter who you are. In the Christian tradition, this water, the water of baptism, it is an outward and visible symbol of an inward and invisible grace. But we've perverted that symbol over the years, making it into a test of faith, which is absurd because grace is unmerited favor. There are no tests. You can't do anything to earn it. It just is. And so this morning, for you who feel like you are standing knee deep in a river and dying of thirst, I want you to know there are no more tests. There are no more purity codes. There are no more arbitrary rules about who gets included and who doesn't. There's just the love of God flowing freely. But it's so easy, it's so easy to fall into old patterns and to believe that that's not true. This week, Emerson and I were talking about his name blessing and about the fact that we were going to do this remembrance of baptism. And, and then I realized I needed to ask Emerson, have you ever been baptized? And he said, no, I have not. And I said, would you like to be baptized? 
And he said, can I? And I said, of course you can. But then I heard that old script. It's so easy. It's so easy for it to come back again. I heard that old script come out of his mouth, and he said, you mean I can? I always thought I had to be good. And I thought I had to be good at church, at doing church. And I said to Emerson, and I say to you all today, oh, love, you do not have to be good, nor do you have to be good at church. And by the way, you are both of those things. <laughs> you are good. And you're good at church because you show up, and actually that's the only thing that's required of being good at church. You just have to show up. You, and all of you, you don't have to do anything. Mary Oliver was right. You don't have to be good. You don't have to walk through the desert on your knees for 100 miles repenting. You just have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves, including loving yourself. Tell me your story, Mary Oliver says, and I'll tell you mine. It's all Jesus ever did. He told us stories about the way God loves us. And so that's what we have to do. We have to keep telling that story over and over and over again. Share the love of God faster because people are parched. Share the love of God faster because people are standing knee deep in a river. They're dying of thirst. And the living water is right here. It's been here all along. Amen.